So let's start somewhere and we'll see how it goes. Well, okay, let me begin by saying the obvious. I keep saying that uh, 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 Marx is the most misunderstood philosopher of all times. That's true because Nietzsche, I mean, in order to be misunderstood, there needs to be something to be understood. And Nietzsche is kind of complicated in that department. Let's put it that way. In the sense that, um, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to disparage Nietzsche. I think Nietzsche is dynamite. He's, he's, prob he's probably the, the intellectual horizon of our time. Like, you, you, ca you cannot get, you know, beyond, we, we, we have not gotten beyond Nietzsche. I don't think there's a single intellectual who can claim to be beyond Nietzsche. So, Nietzsche is our intellectual horizon. Um, but at the same time, he is not a systematic philosopher in any shape, matter, or form. I mean, when he writes, it's more like, uh, you know, when you read Nietzsche, it's more like reading a novel. For example, if you read Zarathustra and you ask, Zarathustra says certain things. Is this Nietzsche speaking or is this just a character in a novel? Well, it's closer to the second uh, 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 sense, character in a novel. And um, it's, it's always, it's uh, huge fun to read academic works about Nietzsche. Because everybody makes whatever they want of Nietzsche. You know, you can read uh, seven different texts. They'll have seven different takes on Nietzsche. Nietzsche is a fascist. Nietzsche is a communist. Nietzsche is a feminist, God forbid. You know, a, a, everybody, everybody makes of Nietzsche what they want. Um, and, you know, um, this is, I should probably, I should, this, I can, this is not really important for this class. But let me mention this as a methodological pre precaution. Uh, yeah, I think if you want to write a serious scientific paper about Nietzsche, either you just... You're just on board with this, and you recognize that uh, uh, Nietzsche stands for nothing, and you just go wild with it without, without, any, without any breaks. But, but you know that, you, that it's you who is, who is going wild, and you're not actually writing an essay on Nietzsche, but you are simply, what's the right phrase? You're like using uh, certain phrases in Nietzsche in, 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 as inspiration to go wild. Or, secondly, secondly um, you know, it, um, it's, good, it's good to have some... What's the right phrase? So uh, the alternative strategy is to try to uh, get certain points of grounding within Nietzsche's work, um, which is very difficult to do, and I'm not sure I'm able to do that. I feel that at the end of the day, there is something like the skeleton of what he's trying to say, but it takes time. So mm, wh why is this? Why is it? Why is this? Like, why am I saying this? Because, because there's this huge corpus of Nietzsche's work, which is usually referred to as Nachlas, which is unpublished things, and it's a, it's a good idea to never reference that unless you know what you're doing. So, and this is, this, is, this, is, this is the reason why Nietzsche can be made to sound like anybody, including a fascist, because if you, ta if you take his unpublished writings, yeah, there's just a, a whole ton of material, which is very hard to classify. Anyway, so, so yeah, so basically you either go, or either go wild or you or bracket the Nachlas. And if you break it the Nachlas, maybe Nietzsche sounds like a, b a bit too boring. But that's complicated. I don't know. I don't know. I, I told you. I told you. This is not going to be a lecture. This is going to be a rant, maybe, to some extent. Um, hmm, actually, it reminds me. I actually wanted to rant about something. But I'll, I will. I will. I, I, need, I need to rant about Nietzsche and Marx at some point before, before this class runs out. Um, anyway. Anyway. Let's start somewhere. So, okay. Why Nietzsche in a class uh, uh, of philosophy of science? So again, hopefully uh, next year, maybe in a couple of years, I will get around to making a proper lecture on Nietzsche. And here, here are some of the things that, in principle, one should talk about when you talk about Nietzsche, especially in the class on philosophy of science. So um, in no particular order, uh, you, we have the problem of truth in Nietzsche. Um, and more specifically, so truth and correspondingly the notion of perspectivism in Nietzsche. Um, in this sense, Nietzsche, to a large extent, is an heir to people like David Hume, and I think Bertrand Russell makes this connection explicitly, and I think Russell is right. Uh, I'm not sure how, how much Hume Nietzsche actually read, but certainly, certainly through Kant, there's an important point of influence. I mean, this notion that uh, uh, any kind of hope at apodictic, um, should I write this on the board somewhere? Maybe here, apodictic. Uh, This doesn't very well. So apodictic justification of our knowledge is impossible. Apodictic meaning like bulletproof. Sometimes they use the word geometric, but apodictic is a, is a, is a, is a better phrase. Um, so apodictic meaning like objective, valid, solid, something that people can agree on. You know, 
basically, yeah, after Hume, this project is more or less dead. I mean, Kant tries to, tries to revive it, but you know, uh, if you've been to my lectures last year, I don't think that Kant is very successful uh, on that front. Um, but you know, re, re, who cares about my opinion? Again, we know today, in philosophy of science today, there is no consensus. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, the people who seem to win, not because they have, a, have an argument, but because nobody else has a better argument, are the co constructivists. So people like uh, um, Willard Van Orman Quine and uh, Thomas Kuhn, to some extent, you know, people who talk about, or Richard Rorty, people who talk about knowledge, uh, human knowledge, as a human practice. That we as humans, we don't really have access to, um, um, you know, verific bulletproof verification procedures. What we have are sociological practices which allow us, again, not to establish truth, but to establish solidarity. That in some sense, the best thing that we can do is something akin to a jury trial. Again, in some sense, this, this erases very importantly the contrast between uh, uh, rhetoric or persuasion on the one hand and truth on the other. So what is the difference between rhetoric and persuasion on the one hand or persuasion on the one hand and truth on the other? And for people like for people like Quine or Kuhn, it's not clear if there is a if there is a clean separation. And um, I could have ended the whole course with Nietzsche. That would be a pretty pessimistic thing to do. So 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 ne so next time next time we will talk about uh, uh, Habermas, who thinks that he can say something about this distinction, <laughs> say something productive about this distinction. So versus Habermas. Um, yeah, but this is this is this is this is probably probably the most important the most important uh, uh, idea in, in Nietzsche that again so negatively we don't have access to truth and positively things which people call true actually stem not from some kind of verification procedure which which gives us access to truth but actually stems from again rather persuasion will to power will to power some kind of fundamental desire, life desire, to impose your will or to impose your vision on others. This is what Weber takes from Nietzsche. Weber talks about how, again, having read uh, David Hume, we know that the data does not speak for itself. The data that does not and cannot interpret itself. So it is a creative, if you want, willful uh, act on the part of the researcher to impose certain structure um, on, the, uh, uh, on the material. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really bad with aesthetics. I don't, I don't understand aesthetics. Partly because, for, I, I suppose this is a grave defect on my part and I need to rectify it at some point. Aesthetics. Because, you know, I understand aesthetics partly as, uh, as ethics and I don't see the distinction between aesthetics and ethics in certain uh, respects. But in other respects, what I'm talking about right now, I mean, this notion that we have from David Hume that uh, uh, perception has an active character, that perception is part imagination. Uh, so I, don't dis I, I cannot distinguish aesthetics from epistemology. So, uh, so like I split aesthetics in half, half ethics, half epistemology, I'm, I don't know what this word means, okay? I can, I can just uh, go out with these two words. Um, so again, in the same way that the, like, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that people like Newton or people like Einstein, for people like Nietzsche, or, so Nietzsche, so in terms of philosophy of science, Philosophers of science, such as Nietzsche and Weber, would characterize Newton and Einstein as uh, people who impose their vision on the world in a quasi-aesthetic fashion. That in some sense, you know, in the same fashion that a critic can uh, uh, propose to you a certain way of reading a picture, in the same fashion, or in a similar fashion, uh, uh, Einstein and Newton propose a certain way of looking at the world without it necessarily being true. Now, it's more or less interesting, more or less fun, more or less productive, but clearly the word productive has to refer to human uh, uh, desires, so productive in terms of satisfaction of our desires, and ultimately all of this can be is reducible to will to power for Nietzsche. Uh, again, with uh, a million caveats, because again, Nietzsche is not a systematic philosopher and it's really hard to talk about him, but th this, idea, this idea is there. This idea is there. Okay, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes I re-listen to my past uh, uh, lectures and I'm horrified how little Nietzsche is there in my lectures on Nietzsche, so let me to at least try to rectify this a little bit. Let me read you a quote from Nietzsche to make sure that we are sort of, that, we, that this is actually a class on Nietzsche and not just me ranting, uh, sidetrack of a sidetrack. So again, what is, what is truth? Nothing, nothing is truth. Truth is, a, it is this false word, is this lie. Okay, here the quote begins. Truth is only a mobile army of metaphors 
metonymies, and anthropomorphisms. A mobile army or a host of metaphors, metonymies, and anthropomorphisms. So basically, the idea is that, um, well, to like really, really oversimplify to infinity, truth is just a lie that has been repeated enough times. Well, of course, if you say that everything is a lie, uh, nothing really is a lie. And that's kind of the point that Nietzsche is trying to make, perspectivism. And there's, of course, a huge problem of uh, self-referentiality, because if nothing is really true, but everything is only uh, uh, sort of can be seen from a certain perspective, how about perspectivism itself? Is perspectivism itself true? I mean, and, uh, and this sounds, like this, I mean, this is, of course, an ancient uh, 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 logical paradox. And some people have a feeling that this is like a, a stupid logical, um, what's the right phrase, like a stupid logical trick that actually it's okay to talk, to talk about perspectivism in this fashion. But I think, no, I think this is a serious challenge and Nietzsche understands that, that this is a ser serious challenge. But if you are really committed to a, form of, to, to a form of perspectivism to which he is committed, which is in part relativism, you have to ask this question, if everything is relative, is relativism itself relative? And again, 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 one way to get out of that is to, uh, you know, through this negative sextian mode where you say, oh, I'm not making positive assertions, I'm just making negative assertions. I'm just saying, mm, look, I do not know whether truth exists or not. I completely bracket out this question. I completely bracket out the question of whether truth exists or not. Um, but so far, nobody has been able to convince anybody else. This is a minimalist position. And, but I think Nietzsche is trying to say something more than that. No, 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 no. This, this, this is a hypothesis for Nietzsche. So this is a working hypothesis. But actually, it's not that truth is unaccessible to us. No, the truth is a, is a positive, strong claim. So the, the truth is the um, product of will to power. And this is, in some sense, maybe to what, you know, the, the issue with which Habermas is. This, is. this is the crack in the whole schema which Habermas is going to try to open up. Um, I'm not sure if this is clear, and, uh, on the one hand. But on the other hand, I'm not sure if I should try to explain this, because this might take a, lot, a long time. But uh, mm, mm. let me, maybe. Uh, um, to try to bring this uh, somehow closer, um, closer to a more coherent presentation, let me talk about this minimalist negative position, which is which which can be associated with people like Sextus, um, and the stronger Nietzschean position that no no no, no again the truth is a strong claim, which Nietzsche cannot really substantiate. Uh, uh, and in some sense doesn't try to substantiate because all this substantiation stuff, this is your games, your positivist games which I'm not playing. So he, you know, in some sense doesn't even try to substantiate this strong claim that no, um, it's not that truth is inaccessible to us. No, truth is accessible to us. And truth is will to power, meaning that everything that people claim uh, 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 as true is actually an expression of their will to power. That basically all attempt at truth making is persuasion. So basically, like, to really, 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 really oversimplify, uh, Nietzsche would like, would want to see uh, the intention of any scholar, let's say me in this room, not as logical, but as pathological. What I am doing here is, you know, some kind of coping strategy. I have this, uh, uh, you know, these dark and perverse desires. I just enjoy, you know, saying these words in a certain fashion. And I enjoy the fact that you uh, sit there and listen to me. And what I'm doing here, first and foremost, or maybe the only thing I'm doing here, is gratifying my desire, which has nothing to do with, with truth for Nietzsche. So, um, well, I could, I could rewrite will to power again. Will to power. Something like that. Uh, and, and again, will... I'll have something to say. Uh, I don't want to say in res I don't want to say in criticism, but maybe in, in a productive uh, response to that, maybe to some extent with respect to Habermas. But next time, okay. So this is this is this is point number one. This is point number one from Nietzsche. And in some sense, again, we have seen this in many, many, many other philosophers today, including Anglo Anglo American analytic philosophers. So. In the beginning, the Anglo-American tradition was very hostile to Nietzsche, but people like Wittgenstein, especially later, later Wittgenstein, agrees with much of what is said here. Again, this notion that in Wittgenstein, that what you have is language games, language games which, which are played according to certain rules. Again, that truth-making is a very human activity. You know, if you want, you want to use a Nietzschean phrase, human, all too human activity, and which has is, which is, you know, no claim or should have no claim to ultimate pretension uh, uh, with respect to you know, truth with capital T. Okay. The uh, second issue um, I want to deal with um, is this notion of subjectivity. After all, Descartes is on the board. And uh, so if you want, this could be, this is like a death of truth, and this is death of subject. Um, 
And in this respect, uh, Nietzsche, I think, is uh, much less uh, revolutionary. What I mean, he was revolutionary at the time, but with, with, for the purposes of this class. Cause this is a really extreme position. I mean, I sometimes include Derrida. Maybe we'll talk about Derrida next time. Derrida comes very close to saying something like this. But apart from Nietzsche and Derrida, you will be very hard-pressed to find people in the history of Western philosophy who are prepared to go so deeply into, uh, you know, into this uh, relativistic abyss. Uh, but death of subject, this, this, one, this one is much more straightforward. Um, so in, in this sense, when Nietzsche is talking about death of subject, I mean, this is the reason to have a class on Nietzsche before, a class on Freud. This is the kind of Nietzsche that everybody talked about last year with either Dominic or Christer. This is like a, you know, a, 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 a textbook Nietzsche. This notion that, again, that uh, an I, the I, the self, is an uh, empty tautology, and in fact what you have be beneath this empty tautology, this uh, mask of unity, what you have is multiplicity. Uh, as Nietzsche puts it, myriad souls fighting with one another for control. Again, instead, instead of this Cartesian ego, um, so not, not unity, but multiplicity. Multiplicity. Uh, and this multiplicity is unconscious and conflictual. When I say unconscious, partly unconscious. Conflictual. Again, this phrase that human beings are anxious, most unconscious products of larger forces of biological and cultural evolution manufactured by these forces not to be happy but to fulfill a certain function within the logic of these systems. Now, this, is, this phrase, this is not exactly Nietzsche, but uh, it's, it's, um, what's the right phrase? it's similar. It's similar to what he's trying to say. Again, that uh, um, again, the self is an empty tautology. It's just a mask of unity which hides a, a myriad souls fighting with one another for control. Again, these uh, 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 unconscious impulses. Or, mm, and I, think, I think Nietzsche, again, this is the, 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 uh, the very short article to read on this from Nietzsche. I'm not even sure if you, if you should call this an article. Maybe you should call this a poem, a philosophical poem, to read about this. From Nietzsche, it's called uh, Über, Über Wahrheit und Lüge in Ausmoralischen Sinne, On Truth and Lie in Extra Moral Sense, uh, where Nietzsche, I think, talks about, at the same time, so the, the unconscious, but, well, actually, both of these are going to be uh, unconscious. The biological drives, what he calls the coils of the intestines, coils of the intestines, that again, there are certain things about our biology which determine our behavior on, over, and above our conscious control. And again, this metaphor of consciousness ju be, just simply being a, 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 a rider atop of a tiger. And the rider may fool himself into thinking that he's actually in control, but that we really who's really in control is the tiger. This metaphor Freud takes from Nietzsche. This is Nietzsche's phrase. He uses this word, tiger. Uh, and um, so partly biological, but partly cultural, this notion that certain um, thing, certain, um, well, what Foucault and later post-structuralists will call disc discourses, discourses, there are certain uh, elements of cultural code that hijack your brain and make you do certain things. One example of this, for example, obviously would be, let's say, slave morality for Nietzsche. Slave morality. And uh, this brings me to another important uh, 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 point, which is, uh, uh, again, this is completely out of order, but let me, just, let me just write this on the board lest I forget. Um, in general, in general, when I'm tr if I have less time for Nietzsche and I just need to get out the most important uh, uh, issues, like in one minute, this is what I focus on. So, um, um, and we talked about this before. Well, actually, I talked about this before. Uh, I inflicted my ranting on you before uh, on, the, on this subject. So we talk about beliefs. Uh, oh, wow, I can't spell this time. Beliefs, desires, and values. And there's this deep suspicion that the degree of certainty is a horrible guide to truth. So certainty is not, does not give you truth. Or the degree of, I don't know, craving is a bad predictor of whether something will make you happy. And the degree of, you know, like moral righteousness or moral indignation or let's say moral zeal has nothing to do with the real morality or immorality of, of an action. And instead, instead, the idea is to see all three values, desires, and beliefs, and again, in this, uh, through this prism of will to power, as mechanisms which control human behavior, as mechanisms which control human behavior. Again, in some sense, uh, similarly, you know, this is this is what I talk about when I talk about Freud. 
to see um, your, your beliefs, desires, and values as, as things which are external and potentially hostile to you, which control your behavior from within or from without. Something like that. Again, this uh, uh, myriad souls fighting for control. Well, some of them are beliefs, some of them are desires, and some of them, of them are values. And very often, these would be in conflict with one another. In fact, I would imagine most of the time. Mm. So, yeah. So, uh, perspective of truth and death of subject. This is, I suppose, again, two of the basic, basic notions for, uh, that you know, one would want to talk about in Nietzsche in a, in a standard um, philosophy of uh, natural, philosophy of natural and social sciences course. But since we also talk about mm, uh, social and political philosophy, Mm, slightly more than is customary in a course like this. Let me also uh, um, talk a little bit about what is what seems to be one of the most productive ideas in Nietzsche. And again, so I, 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 I keep saying, I, I said this at the very beginning, so you, when you take Nietzsche, if you write about Nietzsche, you either just uh, um, drop any pretense of being academical and just let yourself loose, or if you really want to be academical, you need to find anchor points, keeping in mind that these anchor points are few and far between. But I think this is a very strong anchor point in Nietzsche. This is uh, Nietzsche when he comes as close as possible to being a real academic philosopher. And this is, this is um, of course, I'm talking about genealogy of morals. Genealogy of morals. And uh, um, so let me write number three. Genealogy of morals. And uh, um, um, I, am, I am going to contrast this, compare and contrast this with Hegel's uh, master-slave dialectic in a second. But immediately, when, we start, when I start talking about this, genealogy of morals, so there are two methodological things to say before we begin. So the first one, um, why the word genealogy? And secondly, what is the intellectual status of what uh, Nietzsche is trying to do? So what is genealogy and what is this about? Is this a thought experiment? Is this history? What is it? Let's start with genealogy. So genealogy, you understand, this is a straightforward word of both English and Russian language. So uh, uh, like you think of family genealogy, family genealogy. Mm. And the idea is that genealogy is different from standard history, from standard, let's say, history of ideas. Genealogy of ideas would be different from standard <coughs> history of ideas. Because history, again, in Nietzsche's eyes, is trying to present some kind of, uh, what's the right phrase, like decent, orderly account of the past, which tries to show you history as uh, good or maybe inevitable uh, or, or maybe inevitably leading to something progressive and good in the future, something like that, you know, uh, Hegelian history, history as theodicy, history as theodicy, history as uh, 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 um, justification of the world, or, or maybe if you want, cosmodicy, uh, justification of cosmos, or, or the attempt to show that uh, the world is actually not chaotic but cosmetic, the world actually is a cosmos. This is, this is what history is for, um, for Nietzsche. And he is not trying to do this. He's trying to do a genealogy. And the genealogy is like, you imagine, oh yeah, you imagine this uh, uh, upper class bourgeois family, but then you go digging deeper into their genealogy and you find you know, a bunch of rapists, alcoholics, drug addicts, murderers, what have you, you know, uh, uh, degenerates uh, in some incestual relationships, all that kind of thing. So you dig up the dirt. Basically, so you try. So, and this is this this is the contrast. Genealogy is anti-history, if you want. Genealogy is anti-history. It is an attempt to to subvert the standard historical narrative. Oh, should this remind us maybe of the wonderfully uh, one wonderful word which is hugely in vogue today, deconstruction? Yeah, I suppose it it should. Deconstruction. It is an attempt to deconstruct the uh, 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 standard account. And again, by the way, so if you if you ever wonder what the word deconstruction means, this is what it means to break up the, the facade of orderliness and uh, um, decency and, and to find internal contradictions, to find ulterior motives, like, you know, you know deconstru a deconstruction of the text, to, to, you know, to look at, I don't know, Declaration of Independence and find uh, elements of racism and sexism and all that kind of wonderful stuff. Although, although, I should, I should talk, I should talk about this very importantly before the class runs out. This is, this is going to be my, my rent, my rent. Uh, 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 um, Nietzsche versus social justice. You know, let me let me let me talk about this at some point before the class runs out. Oh, th this is this is not going to be pretty, but uh, hopefully, hopefully I will not have a lot of time to uh, embarrass myself in front of the camera. Anyway, uh, um, so um, yeah, so this is sorry. This is a, I understand slightly too long, but you know, 
you get you get you get a lot for, for you know you get Nietzsche and Derrida and deconstruction and genealogy all for the price of one. So anyway, so um, let me go back here. So 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 this is genealogy is this project now. Book genealogy of morals. Is it talking about history? Well, I mean, like historical past. Is it talking about the past, the historical past, or is it, or is this some kind of thought experiment? And my answer is probably both, probably both. So it is talking about the past, but it's also some kind of abstract historical experiment. Um, one second digression. Like I feel that the way you approach uh, philosophy of uh, I mean, history of philosophy, the way I approach history of philosophy, history of ideas, should be something like this, a combination of this uh, historical introduction, but also you know, thought experiment in the sense of you are looking for something timeless. Like um, my own studies of history of philosophy, as I'm doing passes, pass after pass after pass, usually uh, uh, um, conditioned, usually you know, enclosed by, by an academic year, but not necessarily. And this notion that you know, at, this, at this stage in my uh, uh, development, Somewhere up, or maybe down, who knows? Somewhere on my stage right now, I'm on I'm on Hegel. That's why I can I cannot I cannot talk about uh, I cannot talk about Nietzsche because I, I haven't I haven't what's her face like like Nietzsche hasn't been born yet in my timeline in the timeline of my of my current understanding of philosophy. So so this is this is another reason why this is not a good lecture on Nietzsche. Uh, maybe maybe I'm studying Marx a little bit, but you know. Uh, uh, Marx was already taking part in revolutionary activity when Nietzsche was one year old. So, you know, Marx is, in this sense, is an older philosopher. Although I do, I do think that it's very productive to read Nietzsche against Marx and Marx against Nietzsche. Uh, when I say against, against the background of, so if you want together, together to help one another. Anyway, I don't, I don't. Well, anyway, sorry, go back, go back here. So, uh, um, um, this might not have been very clear. So let me go back to this idea: genealogy of morals. So he will, he will talk about certain events in the past. Like, for example, um, the victory of Christianity. So around, well, around the year zero, well, actually, it shouldn't, we shouldn't talk about the year zero, because Christianity actually got going and won in the fourth century, when, you know, at the time of Constantine, there's only 5% of the Roman Empire was Christian, but whatever. So we, so we are talking about the historical victory of Christianity, victory of Christianity. Um, but at the same time, it is a thought experiment. Oh, a thought experiment, what do I mean? Ideal types, yes. Ideal types in the sense of um, that you know, there are certain traits in human life, in human history, in human psychology, which corresponds to what Nietzsche calls master morality and to, uh, to what Nietzsche calls slave morality. And there was an important event in the past which is associated uh, vigor, you know, in, in an important fashion uh, um, with associated in an important fashion um, with the relationship between the two, master and slave morality. But master and slave morality, the interplay between the two can be seen, you know, in all sorts of other you know times and places. And this is like this is a conflict that keeps repeating itself over and over and over again every century, every decade, every year. In fact, maybe every even uh, sorry, maybe even every moment. So um, this is what we're talking about. Okay. So keeping the, and this is a little bit a little bit how Hegel. Uh, means his phenomenology of spirit, because his phenomenology of spirit is also, eh, to some extent, a historical account. Like he will link certain specific stage in his, stages in his uh, uh, progress and the phenomenology of spirit with ancient uh, philosophies of the past. Like he, when he would talk about this uh, pure consciousness perception, but especially empirical consciousness, he would say, oh, this corresponds to Aristotle. And then when he talks about, for example, the master-slave dialectic, especially when he talks about the slaves, he says, oh, and this is Stoicism. So uh, the, uh, phenomen the movement of phenomenology of spirit, to some extent, recapitulates um, like the hi history of Western philosophy. So it is partly a historical account. But partly, it's not a historical account, and it's like a... Uh, it's a logical progression of, of stages through, like, not, not necessarily developmental stages, but like stages of logical precedence of trying to, um, of trying to schematically present what human consciousness is like. But also maybe developmental stages, why not? Stages of development of individual consciousness uh, from the time that a person is born, or maybe from the time that the person is, is starting to do philosophy. So this is, oh, this is, so I'm talking about Hegel's phenomenology. It's fun to talk about everything at the same time. Why not? You know, but uh, digression. Go back, go back, go back to Nietzsche. Go back to Nietzsche, and let's make this very concrete. Okay, if you didn't understand any of this, don't worry too much, because what is important is going to come next. So, <clears throat> what is important, what comes next, is this. Mm. Nietzsche talks about this archetype. 
which he calls master morality. And this master morality for, well, first of all, it is associated with the binary opposition of good and bad. And um, in, an, in an important respect, master morality is one-dimensional. So very similarly to uh, Hegel's, and I'm, sh I'm sure that uh, Nietzsche has Hegelian master-slave dialectics in front of his, you know, in, at the back of his head when he's writing about this. I mean, obviously, uh, Nietzsche was influenced by Hegel. Um, one-dimensional in the sense that master consciousness, the consciousness of the master, is like one-dimensional consciousness without self-consciousness, without reflection. And uh, very importantly, uh, well, or I'm not sure if this is so important, but this is certainly illustrative. There is no distinction between the deed and the doer, and no distinction between the deed and the intention. So if, uh, uh, we can think of this as, uh, um, if you think of a hawk eating a dove, a hawk eating a dove, so like a predator. Uh, or a, light, a lightning, st lightning striking a piece of the earth, or lightning striking a tree, or the master. You know, in an important respect, it's kind of useless to try to judge lightning or hawks or masters in moral terms. They just do what they do without reflection. And, and, and their actions proceed from their nature. You know, in the same fashion that, again, the the uh, action of lightning striking proceeds from the nature of lightning, proceeds from, from, from the nature of electrical discharge. In the same fashion, uh, uh, the actions of the master just proceed from their nature as a master. And again, similarly to uh, um, Hegel, we imagine, is this, is this, is this Nietzsche's attempt at uh, uh, rewriting Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau's state of nature? Maybe, to some extent. So let's, let, me, let, me, let me write this somewhere. In brackets, is this is this akin to Hobbes Locke Rousseau's state of nature? Maybe to some extent, to some extent, of uh, Hobbes Locke and Rousseau. Um, so, in this again, partly historical but partly hypothetical and ideal typical scenario, you have these masters, and these masters just roam the earth. Well, you can maybe maybe these are maybe these are Vikings or nomads or somebody, or or maybe not, or maybe this is just a thought experiment, and uh, they just do their own thing. They're, they're just having fun. And um, if sometimes they cooperate, if they feel like it, sometimes they clash. But when they clash, in, in a certain respect, masters do not have enemies. Like to have an enemy is, is um, like fun and exhilarating for the masters. What they're trying to do is they're trying to express their will to power. You're trying to find the adversary who is as strong as possible, and you try to fight them to the death, maybe, or, or maybe not. But if you, if you fight them, yeah, excellent, you fight them to the death. If you win, more glory to you. If you lose, well, at least you had a good time. I mean, that's, that's the point of the master morality. Again, like this, uh, uh, the discharge of lightning. You ha it happens to strike a tree, and it burns down to the ground. Excellent. You happen to strike into the ocean, and it just dissipates, whatever. I mean, still, this, there's this discharge of the will to power. Um, I'm tempted to draw some, uh, some analogies here between what um, uh, Nietzsche is saying and what Rousseau is saying, especially this notion of how um, in the animal world, usually, my understanding is most of the time, you don't really see animals who are diseased or in acute uh, state of suffering for a long period of time. I mean, the animal is, is either moderately happy and healthy or it's dead. Like, it's, it's, you, you, can, you will not see, you know, especially if you compare it to human societies, you will not see some kind of squirrel who just, uh, you know, uh, has some horrible disease and is uh, uh, kept, um, one, one, one is tempted to ask, out of pity or out of cruelty, kept alive for 20 years, uh, uh, you know, by, by, by uh, you know, um, fellow squirrels who supplied with food or something like that, while, while squirrel is horribly dying of some, you know, uh, horrifying disease or something like that, crippling, crippling disease, debilitating and crippling disease. Anyway, so, um, so, 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 so this, is, this, is, this is the master morality in, in a sentence. And Nietzsche thinks that this master morality captures something, about, is, uh, something uh, uh, essential about being alive. Like, master morality is prior to slave morality, it is more wholesome than the slave morality. It is like, I don't know, self-determining. It is self-contained. It doesn't need anything outside of itself. It is like the default morality, if you want, of the world, of the universe, something like that. So, and uh, by contrast with master morality, Nietzsche is going to talk about slave morality. And um, he is going to associate slave morality with the Judeo-Christian tradition. Now, 
do I want to talk about Nietzsche and anti-Semitism at this point? It's, I mean, it sounds so stupid and boring and just a waste of time. But yeah, I mean, obviously, when, when Nietzsche is talking about the Jews, he's talking about them in, in, the, in this context, like he's using them, he's, he's using the word Jew as a metaphor, as a metaphor, as a placeholder for what he's talking about. I mean, this offends liberal sensibilities, I understand, but this was not Nietzsche's intention. So uh, let, me let me just say, Nietzsche was not an, Nietzsche was not an anti-Semite, uh, uh, especially in the modern or in the Nazi sense of the term, and let me just continue with this. If, if you want, we can go back to this at, at, a, at a different point in time. And by the way, uh, if Nietzsche says something bad about the Jews, uh, uh, the, the same thing would be true uh, in a double respect for the Christians. So, have to keep this in mind also. Um, is Nietzsche an anti-Christian? Is Nietzsche an anti-Semite? Probably not. Is Nietzsche an anti-Christian? Well, again, nuance, nuance. Ha people have to introduce nuance. Nietzsche has some interesting things to say about Jesus, uh, like the only Christian. There was only one Christian and he died on the cross. But okay, I don't want to talk about everything at the same time, even though I'm doing that a lot in, in today's class. Let me just go back to try to maybe, again, uh, 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 draw some kind of uh, more coherent picture about slave morality. So slave morality is not about good and bad, but it is about good and evil. Good and evil. So we are inventing, the slaves are inventing a new category. Where do you get slaves? You see, slaves, for, for Nietzsche, as well as for Hegel, they, do, they are, they do, like, what's the right phrase? They're not primary, they do not exist in themselves. They are not a thing. They are a defective response to the existence of masters. Like, they are a subordinate secondary phenomenon which appears in response to the primary and self-sufficient phenomenon of the master. So the way Hegel takes, tells the story is that he imagines some kind of defective master who at one particular point, instead of uh, 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 trying to fight to the death, instead decides, you know, is, is afraid to die, you know, acquires this fear of death. And maybe, maybe we should write this, uh, 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 this term, fear of death, because this is fear of death, or, 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 or in general fear. Fear, maybe fear of death. And in, in, out of fear, out of cowardice, out of lack of maybe will to power, the desire to, or, or, or some kind of perversion, perversion or sickness of will to power. Yeah, so perversion or sickness, sickness of will to power. Mm, in the seminar, in the seminar. Um, out of perversion or sickness of the will to power, the, 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 the slaves um, decide to submit. Uh, afraid of the masters. And what happens is that, you know, if they just submitted, they would be fine. But then, well, again, Nietzsche tells this interesting story. The masters are clearly more powerful. If you think, if you think of the Roman Empire, uh, the Romans, the Roman nobles are powerful, they're in charge, and the Christians are a tiny minority, 5% of the population. Uh, uh, they're down, downtrodden, hated by everyone, and thrown to the lions. But uh, Nietzsche wants to say that, again, the master morality and master consciousness is one-dimensional. Masters just, you know, they do this thing that they want to do, and then they switch on to the next. They cannot focus on anything for too long, because it's just boring. But the problem is that, again, slave morality is very important. Slave morality is secondary. It is subordinate. You, cannot, you, you can't have masters without slaves. You cannot have slaves without the masters. The slave morality is subordinate, and it, it, like it's, it takes its bearing negatively from, like, it, it is defined negatively as not master morality. Slaves are not masters. So the slaves are uh, uh, afraid of the masters. Maybe they're enslaved by the masters, but not necessarily. They're, clearly, they are afraid of the masters. And the masters are the only thing that they can think of. So master morality, is multi-focused. It's focused on uh, anything and everything, and uh, the focus is constantly changing. It is a flux. Whereas slave morality only thinks about one thing, about the masters, and how the masters are evil. And the slave morality, again, in this sense, is, is, is secondary in many ways, but also because the way you define evil is uh, by identifying masters as evil. Mm. Because, again, 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 see, this distinction between good and bad for Nietzsche is a natural distinction. This is, again, naturalistic ethics. That, naturally speaking, a lightning capable of discharging itself is good. Like a, display, a display of power in a naturalistic fashion. Like a, the river flowing without dams or dikes or obstacles. This is the, the display of the will to power. But a river which is obstructed or the stream is broken up or something like that, this is, this is like, again, in a naturalistic fashion, the... Uh, perversion or stopping or sickness or whatever, blocking of this display of, or expression of the will to power. 
So, so, so the master morality in this sense is natural, naturalistic. Maybe I should write this word naturalistic somewhere. Um, whereas, whereas slave morality, in a, in a very important respect, is, is um, fictitious. It is invented. It is false, mendacious. It doesn't like like, like this is this is an imaginary morality. This is this this is this is this is a, a product of craft. Um, invention. And again, the way that the slaves invent this morality is because their own will to power is perverted and sick, because if it wasn't, they would fight with masters to the death. What they do instead is they create these categories in which they re-describe the actions of masters as evil. So they are basically going to, and, and this, is, this is for Nietzsche, this is the first revaluation of values which happens in history. Revaluation of values, which happens in history. Now Nietzsche himself advocates a different revaluation of values, and in a very Hegelian fashion. You know, I'm almost tempted to, to write this on the board as well. So uh, undifferentiated unity, differentiated disunity, and differentiated unity. And Nietzsche, Nietzsche's revaluation of values is a return to master morality, but on a higher level. It is a return of master to, to it is a return to master. So this, would, this would be the master morality. This would be the slave morality, and this would be the morality of the Ubermensch. And the Ubermensch, in an important sense, is a synthesis of the slave and the master morality, uh, because it will take certain productive elements in the slave morality and incorporate it into itself. In a second, I'll talk about that. Hopefully, so this is the first revaluation of values. And uh, basically, again, this story, I'm not sure if this story is historically very plausible, but this is what Nietzsche is saying, that again, the, the slaves, mm, because they are many, and because um, masters are the only thing they, they, they care about, is that in long stretches of historical time, again, Rome becomes Christian, but also this is a struggle that repeats itself, I suppose, for Nietzsche, uh, day in and day out, uh, uh, slaves, have the, have the deck stacked in their favor. Slaves are, in some sense, bound to win because uh, the masters, in some sense, like, they, they, they don't have immunity. They don't have mimetic immunity against this. They, 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 they do not have intrinsic elements, intrinsic uh, uh, defense mechanisms to fight against this kind of slave morality. And slaves, if they, if they push long enough, if they push long enough, they win. And they are able to convince the masters that actually the masters are evil. And what they create, very importantly, is conscience. So let me, write, let me write two words on the board. One is priests, and I need to talk about the priests in a second. So priests, and the other word is uh, conscience, sovist, right? So I said that the master morality is one-dimensional. The slave morality is, in a very important respect, two-dimensional, two-dimensional. You exist, but you also describe your existence in a certain way. Ah, isn't this like uh, Freudian id and this like Freudian superego? Yes, yes. Well, not exactly, but Freud is taking elements from this picture. You don't just exist, but you also describe yourself in a certain way. Oh, isn't this Kahneman's, uh, uh, you know, remembering and experiencing self? You know, this Sprachlichkeit uh, I kept talking about. Yes, yes, yes. Everything. Isn't this Foucault's discourses? Everything, everything, you know. Uh, um, so not two for the price of one, but everything for the price of one. Um, so again, so priests um, and conscience. Now... So I talked about conscience. Hopefully, this is more or less clear. So again, 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 again. So the, the slaves create this discourse. Create this discourse, if you want. And this discourse, like, like a virus, infiltrates the head of the, the, head of the masters. And um, I was reminded, because when, when I talk about history, doesn't Nietzsche say that this transition happened sort of uh, when, uh, hum when, 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 when beings crawled out of the ocean? and began to walk the earth. So when we talk about this as a, a Roman Empire becoming Christian, well, because, you know, I was talking about this stuff, uh, how, how conscience, discourse infiltrates the head. I was thinking, yeah, but in order for masters to have their head infiltrated, they already, already need to have uh, certain like uh, elements of sociality which hunt, hunt together as developed. Does this contradict Nietzsche? No, no, it doesn't contradict Nietzsche, because Nietzsche isn't talking about Christianity. He is uh, talking about some kind of, you know, very, if he's talking about the past, if he's talking about the past, he's talking about some kind of time immemorial. And so you can, you can include uh, uh, the transition from apes to humans into, into this picture as well. Mm. Or maybe, or maybe, do, do, do chimpanzees have conscience? Who knows? Okay, write your essay about this or, or, or next year or something, whatever. Um, mm, so, again, so again, conscience, conscience is one important element of the story. But why the priests? Why the priests? 
Well, of course. And by the way, I always find this such an interesting point to think about because uh, Nietzsche is going to say, well, look, th that's the whole point of the slave morality. The slave morality is uh, uh, downtrodden. It's uh, broken. It's sick. It's not creative. It is not productive. It cannot create anything. So the people who really create slave morality are not the slaves because they are futile and fruitless. It is the priests. And the priests are the masters who are perverted. They are, they are perverted masters. So, the, so, so priests occupy some kind of halfway position between uh, the masters and the slaves. So um, perverted masters. So they are defective masters, if you want. Let, let me write the word defective. Defective masters. And this is such a wonderful, uh, you know, such a fruitful archetype. <laughs> Such a fruitful idea that you can find so many examples in the history of the world. How about Greci brothers in Rome? I mean, that's the whole point. Greci brothers are members of the nobility. Uh, Bratia Gracchi, right? Uh, they are members of the nobility. What do they do? They, they try to uh, instigate this slave revolt. They, they are, uh, the pretenses are, the pretenses are, they pretend to actually care about the poor. But do they actually care about the poor? Or are they just trying to make their head in the, uh, uh, you know, in the Areopagus? Well, it's not the Areopagus, obviously, but, I mean, but in the, in the uh, um, you know, among the, nobil among the Roman nobility. And, and the Greci brothers are defective, defective masters. They cannot win against the ancient noble houses of Rome by fair means. And that's why they try to mobilize the public. They try to mobilize the poor. Again, this is the story, which is, you know, as old as, old as the universe. Again, you know, I don't want to start my rant on uh, social, uh, uh, social justice just now, but this is, this is immediately, this is the suspicion that Nietzsche is going to have. Oh, you talk about the social justice. Isn't this just defective priests trying to mobilize the masses for their own, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, what's the phrase, for their own indecent, for their own, what's the right phrase, like a pathological uh, base, Desires to gratify their desires again between every accusation, you know, so, so, you know, you you uh, uh, dress yourself in the white robe. Oh, I am against sexism, or, or or I am against racism. Whereas in fact, this is like like one member of faculty trying to accuse another member of the faculty in order to simply to get ahead, and just using this discourse of quote unquote social justice, which by the way nobody cares about, uh, uh, using this uh, discourse of social justice simply as a pretense. Um, I have seen with this with my own eyes, but I don't want to talk about this. Mm. Anyway, so um, go back a step to this picture. This is getting a little bit too autobiographical, which it should be. Um, so this is the master morality and the slave morality. Mm. And, and again, the, 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 point, the point is that slave morality wins. And uh, again, when and how, or at least, at least in terms of this thought experiment, th ideal typical thought experiment, slave morality wins. And human beings become sick. This is, this is the result. We become sick. So this transition to slave morality. But also, also, Nietzsche says, we become interesting. And more specifically, again, what, if, I, if I, I keep saying that the Ubermensch is the synthesis of the master morality and the slave morality, in what sense the Ubermensch is the synthesis? What is the productive positive element that the Ubermensch will take from slave morality? Self-consciousness. This uh, uh, doubling of consciousness, this ability to not just act, but to also think about the way you act. The master does not create his life as a work of art. The master is, simply is, simply exists in a, in, a, in a straightforward fashion. For Nietzsche, the Ubermensch creates himself as a work of art. So for, for Nietzsche, you have this doubling of consciousness. In some sense, the Ubermensch first creates himself in his consciousness you know, as a model, and then uh, um, you know, realizes this model in reality, something like that. I'm oversimplifying a little bit. By the way, immediately, so I, I have to talk about my favorite abyss of the purpose of scarce of matter, you know, the schlund, the sveklos and cows, the material, right? So uh, it's uh, that time of the lecture. But before I do, th uh, doesn't this, doesn't this, shouldn't this, or doesn't this remind us of the, the camel, the lion, and the child? So what about the camel? So again, 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 so we have this story. The first, the spirit has to become camel, Second, it has to become the lion, and the third, it has to become the child. So this is, this is Nietzsche from Zarathustra. So it's important that all three elements are needed, and all three elements are steps along the way. So again, the first step, camel, it, uh, uh, is um, you are taking upon yourself a burden. This is the mom moment, if you want, of self-discipline, of self-discipline. Mm. 
I mean, Nietzsche puts this as a, thou shalt, thou shalt, the commandments, right? Uh, so self-discipline. And this is necessary. You know, so again, this, is, this was not necessary for the masters. This was not necessary for the masters. But this will be necessary for the Ubermensch, because the Ubermensch is not just a master. Again, so it's, it's second re revaluation of values, it is a return, again, like a, a dialectical return to the master morality, but on a new level, with new additions. So self-discipline, as the first point, is important. You cannot immediately become an Ubermensch. You have to go through a period of self-training. You know, this is exa exactly what Hegel says, exactly what Hegel says. That again, you know, we talked about this, Taiki talked about this last time. So uh, slave master is my consciousness for another. I have to learn to submit to another. And in learning to submit to another, I learn to discipline myself. Uh-huh, so should I, should I? So maybe, maybe I should write this. So uh, uh, consciousness for another. So this, 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 would, this would be the consciousness in itself. This one, for another. The slave consciousness. And the Übermensch is in itself plus for itself. The synthesis of the two. But, but the first element, the productive element is there. Again, you, the spirit must first become the camel. Secondly, the spirit becomes the lion. And the lion has to slay the dragon of uh, 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 you know, Christian religion or something like that. Uh, and the, the dragon has scales, and on every scale, there's, it is written, thou shalt, right? And the lion has to, has to uh, uh, slay, slay the dragon. But this is, this is, this is, a, this is a purely negative, negative element. This is an element of pure negativity. Pure negativity. Ah, should this remind us of abstract personhood in Hegel, this notion of, you know, a basic fundamental um, <coughs> prerequisite of all freedom. Just purely saying no to everything and in order to then, like, to, after you have cleared the ground, cleared the ground of potentially free choice, of then making positive choice according to some reason. Yeah. So this, this is the element of pure negativity. But then the third element, the third element is the spirit becomes the child, and this is this is the most complicated stage, because I don't think I don't think that Nietzsche. Uh, well, you see, again, does Nietzsche have a theory of how you become a child? I don't think so. I think for Nietzsche, it's like it's more like an ideal, like a spell, like an incantation, and it's like uh, in some sense maybe it is Kantian ought implies can, Kantian ought implies can. You. Uh, life must have meaning, therefore we should be able to create meaning. O ought implies can. We ought to create meaning, therefore we can create meaning. But does Nietzsche have a proof of that? I don't think so. And what is the procedure for how, ch how the child creates meaning? It's not exactly clear. Mm. And I like to read Nietzsche alongside uh, Marx and Mill. I think it's very productive. And um, I can understand uh, this uh, stage of the child in terms of uh, uh, Mill's notion of development. Uh, and I, I, don't think, I don't think that, that Mill and Nietzsche are necessarily at odds because, again, Nietzsche is also talking about self-cultivation. He is talking about this, uh, you know, life as a work of art. And, uh, um, and also, also, yeah, very important, well, again, you can, you can find quotes in Nietzsche to support whichever position you want. But uh, I think the standard textbook interpretation is that Nietzsche does not believe in free will, although, who knows? You know, but uh, Nietzsche talks about how free will is the invention of slave morality. Free will is the invention of slave morality, like in the invention of Christianity. I mean, why, why do you invent notions such as God or free will? Okay, this is completely out of order, but let me, let me talk about this now, lest I forget. Um, God, free will, immortality, that kind of thing. So Nietzsche completely, so he takes Kantian line of reasoning and he reverses it, reverses it 180 degrees. So Nietzsche basically says, because we cannot know what is true, asking for justification, like proofs of God's existence, that's useless. That's useless and that should be out of the question. Because the question uh, uh, of truth cannot be settled, we should look at two other things. We should look at, at uh, uh, genealogy and consequences, causes and consequences. Mm causes and consequences. And again, uh, when we talk about Kant, I always find this, you know, the separation between uh, reason and faith, I always find this so extremely problematic. I mean, I, I even want to say intellectually bankrupt. Because when Kant says, oh, reason has nothing to do with faith, but n notice every person, as a matter of genealogy, has some kind of particular, usually very straightforward reason why they have a particular faith. You know, it's not, it's not like reason has nothing to do with faith and I'm free to believe whatever I want. No, the 99% of people believe what their parents told them to believe. 
I mean, and, th and this, is, this is a very straightforward and a very uh, you know, base, very, I don't know, indecent, intellectually indecent reason uh, uh, to, have, to have a particular religion. So, and, so if the question of, of truth is out of the picture, this becomes hugely important. And the fact that the genealogy of your religious belief is indecent makes the belief itself indecent, intellectually indecent. And the second, the second issue, of course, is always consequences, consequences. So what are the consequences of religious belief? And again, Nietzsche wants to say that religious belief is uh, life denying. OK, maybe let's talk about this uh, uh, in a bit, although probably it's already more or less clear from what I've written on the board. Anyway, so uh, yeah. Why, did, why was I talking about this? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Andre. Exactly, exactly. Yes, so God, free will, and morality. So uh, Nietzsche is going to say, do human beings have free will? Again, Nietzsche, Nietzsche is not Kant, so he doesn't say any of these things. This is what I, like, this is what I, I don't want to say, well, this is what I read from Nietzsche. No, no, no. This is what I'm inspired to think by looking at certain things in Nietzsche. So what Nietzsche inspires me to think about is this. Can we really prove that human beings have free will? No, we cannot one way or another. But we have, you know, with this, this uh, slave morality, this Christian slave morality, which wants to, sell, to, to um, send masters to hell for all eternity. And in order for God to not be a complete jerk, if he's going to uh, send somebody for all eternity, you know, you need to explain that it was their pure free will. They have chosen to, to commit the sins. And that's why they cannot be absolved. Mm. This, this would be this would be this would be Nietzschean uh, 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 moral or, or anti-moral. I don't know what's the right phrase. Eth ethical uh, disproof, you know, disproval of the notion of free will. Um, same thing talking about immortality and uh, the other world. Nietzsche will talk about how sick, sickness, sickness. Do we know that life, you know, whether there's life after death or not? We don't. We don't. But Nietzsche is going to say that the, the causes and the consequences of belief in the afterlife are both indecent. And life denying, but you know, live in this world, focus on this world. It, it, it is only sickness, sickness of spirit, and perversion of will to power, which causes people to postulate um, existence beyond this world. Okay, so yeah, a million other things to talk about. So the camel line on the child. You know, let me let me. I, I haven't written anything here. Let me just write a question mark because who knows? Who knows? Okay. Oh yes, this is the, the time of the abyss. Now is the time of the abyss. Der Schlund, der Zwecklosen Chaos, der Materie, right? The world is the purposeless chaos, uh, mm, the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter. The abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter. In some sense, this is the starting point of all of Nietzsche's philosophy. By the way, notice this is one hour into the lecture, I haven't even mentioned death of God. It's very interesting, right? Uh, usually, I, I should, let, let's, let's talk about death of God, maybe, if we have time later, but, uh, well, actually, no, God is dead here on the board. This is the death of God, okay, okay, I, I've, I've mentioned death of God. Okay, we can tick that box. Um, go back a step. So, the abyss of the purpose of scarce of matter. This, maybe, if this was a proper lecture, this is maybe a good, a good place to start this whole discussion. What is Nietzsche try, trying to do? What is his project? And I think the project is that after people like uh, uh, Hume and Kant, after philosophers, after the revolutions of human Kant, uh, uh, honest intellectuals can see that there's no way that we can still believe the Aristotelian picture that you know we are at home in the world and this world is made for us. That basically what stares us in the eye is the abyss. And uh, again, a very famous, uh, um, very famous image from uh, from Nietzsche. I wonder if maybe when Nietzsche talks about the abyss, maybe he actually means a quote from Kant of the abyss of the purpose of chaos of matter. So, but that's, that's the point. Again, this is the starting, starting position of all of Nietzsche's philosophy. You know, in some sense, this is the fundamental question of all of Nietzsche's philosophy. How can life have meaning in the universe which is completely devoid of meaning? So if the universe is really the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter, how can my life have any meaning at all? Mm. Mm. Also, an interesting, and I think a productive way of thinking about Nietzsche is to think of Nietzsche as, a, as an atheist Lutheran, as an atheist Lutheran. Let me explain what I mean. Um, so in Luther, you have this individual relationship between man and God. This Kierkegaardian fear and trembling. You are alone, one on one, in the face of God. So this is Nietzsche, but without God. You are alone, on your own, in the face of the universe. And this universe is not God who fills you with fear and trembling. It's something much worse. It is the abyss of the purposeless case of manner. This uh, uh, primordial Lovecraftian silence, 
whatever, or, 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 or ominous silence out of which anything can spring, who knows, right? And in some sense, again, 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 this is, this is the fundamental question of Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's whole philosophy. And he tells this story, and this story is supposed to debunk all existing uh, uh, forms of ethics, and especially, so if you, if, even if you want to return to this master morality, I, I have this, this, this wonderful phrase in Nietzsche, you know, is Nietzsche utilitarian? Like, Nietzsche versus Mill. Again, this very interesting phrase. What matters, this, this, is, this is from uh, Zarathustra, from actually Zarathustra himself speaking. What matters my happiness? It is poverty and filth and wretched contentment. What matters my happiness? It is poverty and filth and wretched contentment. contentment. We cannot simply unthink this revolution. We already have conscious, conscience. We already have self-consciousness and reflectivity. We cannot simply go back innocently to being, a mas to being masters. If we decide that we want to gratify our desires, this is still a rational decision that we need to make in the face of the abyss, in the face of understanding that no possible justification can be given for that. Mm. This is the problem. And you know, I, I've been thinking about this phrase for a very long time, because again, I, I am myself something of a utilitarian, and I'm a huge fan of John Stuart Mill. So I have been rereading this phrase, <laughs> look this up, but this phrase has a second part. Do you know what the second part is? What matters my happiness? It is poverty and filth and wretched contentment. What is the next sentence? <laughs> but my happiness ought, ought to justify existence itself. But my happiness ought to justify existence itself. So is Nietzsche utilitarian? Is this a conflict with John Stuart Mill? Because he says happiness is poverty, filth, and wretched contentment, but it is my happiness which ought, and the only thing I suppose which can justify existence itself. I don't know. Yeah, Nietzsche is a paradoxical philosopher. But, you know, I, I, will, I will use this as an excuse to say that, yeah, yeah, Nietzsche is a kind of utilitarian. He doesn't know. I mean, he, he, doesn't, I mean, he, he uh, you know, shoots arrows at John Stuart Mill. He hasn't read Mill. He doesn't understand Mill. You know, in fact, if you, if you read Mill and Nietzsche side by side, I mean, of course, Mill is boring as hell. It's true, compared to Nietzsche. But I think the ultimate insights um, are approximately the same, to the extent that you can talk about insights in Nietzsche. Uh, again, in terms of in terms of this, you know, actual actual idea of how uh, Nietzsche imagines this, uh, uh, you know, Ubermensch, because the Ubermensch obviously is not some kind of you know uh, crazy maniac who's hacking everybody to bits with an axe. But I mean, Nietzsche's Ubermensch is actually probably a really boring person. I mean, uh, there's like some kind of you know a uh, musician or a poet, people like Goethe, for example. And I mean, I mean, if you talk about Goethe, wouldn't John Stuart Mill and Nietzsche agree? Oh yeah, yeah, it's an example of Ubermensch. But this is, you know, in some sense. Boring. I mean, if you tell your parents, when I grow up, I want to, you know, you know, parents, I have been, I've spent time reading Nietzsche, and your parents are terrified, and I have decided what I want to do with my life, and your parents are like, horrified, what have you written in Nietzsche? I want to be like Goethe, and your parents are like, oh, thank God. Because honestly, this is not, this is not some kind of uh, uh, subversive and interesting position. Anyway, sorry, sorry. Go, let's go back to this issue again. It wasn't a straight speech, which you were... Uh, oh, but not, was, nothing, nothing, nothing. It was, it was, it was that... Um, you, man, should ask yourself, what is my uh, heaven? Mm. It's nothing but, and so on. It wasn't about the uh, it wasn't about Ubermensch, it was about... Um, in Nietzsche, in Nietzsche, nothing is direct speech, okay? So, so I'm, I'm releasing the break. But we can talk about this in the seminar. I'm, I'm very curious to see what you hear. I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is some kind of final uh, judgment on what Nietzsche is trying to say. I, again, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's really appropriate to talk about, again, insights from Nietzsche. But I'm, you know, if there are other conflicting uh, uh, passages from Nietzsche, I would, be, uh, very much, I would very much like to uh, uh, look at them. And I'm sure there are. I'm 100% sure that there are. In fact, again, before I looked at the <laughs> second part of the sentence, I was only focusing on the first part. And again, it doesn't, you see, it's important for Nietzsche. Nietzsche is not a utilitarian, in, at least in this sense, that again, you cannot simply go back to being a master. You cannot just say that good and bad are na naturalistically good. Again, this is what George Edward Moore calls naturalistic fallacy. When George Edward Moore is uh, arguing against um, uh, Mill, so boring to talk about Moore on intellectual Nietzsche, but whatever. So you cannot do that. And, and, and Nietzsche understands this. If you want to accept this morality, you can do it by the force of your will. This has to be a decision. Na kind of naturally, in and of itself, this morality can does not prove itself. It's not a natural standpoint. Like you, if you choose it, it is still it has it still has to be your free choice. Anyway, so um, but again, 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 that's the, the the point. The point in Nietzsche. The point in Nietzsche. It seems ultimately. Although, again, 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 what does Nietzsche, Nietzsche is a poet, does he have any positions? But, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the point that I will put forward uh, tentatively 
as inspired by reading Nietzsche, is that, again, the universe is the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter, and the only thing that can justify universe is our um, free, creative, uh, artistic uh, attempts to impart meaning through, some, through, through something like aesthetics. So, uh, again, so we have the abyss, and the only, the only uh, um, escape from the abyss is will, which, which imparts meaning to the universe uh, through something like art. Although, I, of course, I have to immediately art with the three question marks, because immediately, this is, this is, what, this is what Nietzsche uh, uh, talks about in The Birth of Tragedy, and we all know that Nietzsche went back to this book and ransacked it. And he, later, Nietzsche disagrees with the conclusions of the early book. Because again, in the, in the early book, it's actually it's very Schopenhauerian, right? Birth of Tragedy. It's very Schopenhauerian, and it's also partly like Buddhist, maybe. Again, this is the whole point, the whole point. Again, the only possible theodicy in the birth of tragedy. It's completely out of order, because we talked about all this. Well, now let's go back to the birth of tragedy. What, what are we talking about? Again, remember, uh, Silenus tells to the king Midas in Euripides' tragedy, I think, that the horrible truth which men should not know, is that the best thing for a human being is not to be born at all. But if you are born, if you are born, the second best is to die as soon as possible. This is, this is a, 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 a satyr. Tells to the legendary King Midas. Uh -huh. It's a very famous story. The name of the satyr is Selenus. Selenus. And uh, Nietzsche wants to say that tragedy is a response like, from within this statement, you say, yes, Selenus is right. It is right. This universe is the abyss of the purpose of scarce of matter. In fact, it's better to not be born. But, in spite of all this, we will. We will say yes to life. We will affirm life. We will not rationally, not uh, apotectically, but we will find strength of will to affirm life, even though we know that life has no meaning and no purpose. And uh, the way Nietzsche portrays this in The Birth of Tragedy is very much like a... I'm not sure, I mean, I, I think it works psychologically, but Nietzsche ultimately considers this a horrible cop-out. Mm. He wants to say, again, you imagine yourself to be a Dionysian, Dionysian chorus which dreams the Apollonian dream. So you imagine that this whole world is just a dream. So, oh yeah, horrible things happen to you in your life, but you try to look at yourself as if you are an actor in a tragedy. And, and through this, you derive a certain, if you want, aesthetic pleasure from what, what is happening. But this, this, remind, this should remind us immediately of Gnostics and Pythagoreans. Do you remember the question that Christian asks? According to the Pythagoreans, there are different kinds of people who come to the Olympic Games. Some of them come to spectate. Some of them come, 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 to, well, some of them come to participate. Some of them come to place bets. But the best ones, the best ones, according to the Pythagoreans, are the ones who come to spectate. Again, uh, Jesus says... <laughs> In the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, become passers-by, become passers-by. We are simply traveling through this world as, uh, um, you know, detached spectators. You know, in this Buddhist fashion, this world is the veil of Maya, is the veil of Maya. This is all untrue, this is all an illusion. And we, we all, we, 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 we understand the fundamental non-reality of this. Is this sexist empiricus? Yes, exactly, this is sexist empiricus. This is how skeptics achieve ataraxia. Nothing is true, or at least we commit to nothing being, being true. We, we approach this world without intellectual or, or uh, passionate commitment, and we just, you know, we spectate. And in, in being spectators, we sort of trick ourselves. In some sense, yeah, like we recognize life is just a dream. And we say, yes, it's just a dream, I want to dream on. But the reason you can <coughs> wish to dream on is because you realize it's just a dream. And yeah, horrible things happen, like, you know, uh, Oedipus pokes his eyes out, but nobody rushes to the stage uh, to save him, because it's a dream, it's a fun dream, let's just, let's, just, let's, see, let's see how it ends. And, and this, this for Nietzsche, again, this is early Nietzsche giving a response, and later Nietzsche thinks this is a cop-out, in the sense that, like, you understand the word cop-out, right? It's a, it's a, 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 it's a compromise, it's, it's not a real solution, it is, a, it is an escapist solution. Uh, the, the real Ubermensch, will say, no, this world is not a dream. This world is the only thing that is. In fact, in fact, this is, this is where later in Nietzsche you get this notion of <laughs> eternal recurrence. Eternal recurrence. Like, this is maximally not a dream. This is, in fact, the only thing that there is. And let's imagine, for the sake of a thought experiment, that this 
moment will keep happening over and over and over and over again. N not a dream, not nothing. But, and and can, can, we have, can we still, do we still, and can we still have the will or the power, or the will to power if one, to say yes even to this world of eternal recurrence? And this is kind of, you know, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, later Nietzschean way of trying to rewrite the birth of tragedy, or, uh, you know, what's the right phrase, to correct the, uh, to, you know, to present a contrasting solution to what he talked about in the birth of tragedy. Hmm. When I talk about Nietzsche, very often, this comes under the rubric of uh, individual project. Because again, 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 so this is <laughs> philosophy of the natural sciences, this is philosophy of the social sciences, this is our foray into social and political theory, and this obviously has all sorts of social and political implications, uh, especially for later philosophy. But um, mm, again, within a course like this, usually when I talk about Foucault and Nietzsche, but espe especially Nietzsche, um, and we talk about this um, conflict consensus, so conflict consensus stuff, I place Nietzsche re tentatively but uh, uh, radically on the side of conflict. So conflict consensus. And Nietzsche would be on the side of conflict. And because Nietzsche is on the side of conflict, I mean, this solution, the Ubermensch solution, seems to be more of an individual rather than, rather than, uh, 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 rather than a social solution, right? So this is, this is how you, again, in the, in the words of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, we cannot go back to the state of nature as a society, but you individually can approximate something like this and derive uh, happiness from the sentiment of your own existence, become like this romantic painter or poet escape somewhere into the cave. Rousseau kind of talks about this as, as one possibility. Isn't this what Nietzsche is trying to say, right? So these, these, these Ubermensch, an individualistic solution to the problem of modernity. Again, so we start from this undifferentiated unity of the idiocy of a feudal life, then we have this differentiated disunity of the capitalist society, and we don't get differentiated unity, but you yourself, you disentangle yourself from society, and you become an, an undi a differentiated unity with yourself. By the way, notice, notice, so undifferentiated unity is self-consciousness without self-consciousness. Differentiated disunity, consciousness against self-consciousness, people wrecked by guilt, and differentiated unity, consciousness and self-consciousness in harmony, reharmonized by this uh, artistic project of the Ubermensch. Again, this issue of uh, um, um, life as a work of art. Okay, so the, the last thing... Uh, uh, from this, from this. So, so, so is this is this an, individual, an individualistic project? To some extent, yes. And again, both Foucault and Nietzsche seem to hint at that. And uh, especially Foucault in his later writings, when he talks about this again, uh, hermeneutics of the self. This is very much. It's not really a project of social transformation. It's a project of individual transformation. But having said all of this, fortunately, I only have one minute to rant. So let me rant. Um, People very often talk about how Nietzsche is a critic of Marx. Leo Strauss actually does this. And this is so stupid, because first of all, as, as I have not been able to find a shred of evidence that Nietzsche even knew who Marx was. He did. Mm, he was very concerned. If you know, if you have this evidence, if you have this evidence, show it to me. I have not been able to find evidence that Nietzsche knew who Karl Marx was. Now, Nietzsche criticizes socialists. That's true. But Marx also criticizes socialists. So when you talk about the communist revolution as the revenge of the poor against the rich, you've lost the game. Okay. So, so I, in the seminar, I want to insist, I want to insist on reading Nietzsche through Marx and on reading Marx through Nietzsche. And I think that people who see uh, 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 Nietzsche as anti-Marx do not understand Marx in a very important fashion. Because again, the, the, whole, the whole point of Marx's project is for, for humanity to go forward. This is not, again, Nietzsche has this phrase, resentment, or, well, the, the, he uses German, ressentiment. This, we, we are not talking about this with the, with the communist revolution. Uh, we are talking, if you want, a, a fullness of life, expression of our will to power. And again, that's the whole point. Uh, 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 Marx writes in the communist ideology, sorry, yeah, in the German ideology, in the German ideology, he writes about um, egoism versus altruism, and he says, this is gonna be a meaningless distinction. Uh, uh, um, in communism, because again, the other people do not um, restrict your freedom, they enable your freedom. And Nietzsche would so much agree, because among the Ubermensch, 
true friends challenge one another. That's the whole point. You, uh, the Ubermensch has some kind of, you know, maybe local community, or at least some people, or at least some rivals. But and rival, rivals in the true sense of the word. Again, your, your, your friend, you're not supposed to take pity on, but your friend is supposed to be somebody who stimulates you to move forward. So I think, again, again I think that uh, uh, in, in a deep sense, there is no contradiction. And, and secondly, so I think that it is important to read Nietzsche through the prism of uh, sorry, to read Marx through the pris prism of Nietzsche. I think it is important to re read Marx through the prism of Nietzsche, but also the other way around, to read Nietzsche through the prism of Marx. Mm. In the sense that when Nietzsche talks about slave morality, I mean, in some sense, yeah, especially to the extent that he talks about the, how there's no free will, it's kind of clear that the slaves, in an important, in important respect, are not to blame for being slaves. In fact, I have a quote, but, you know, uh, quotes from Nietzsche are uh, uh, a dime a dozen. They're pretty useless, because you can find a quote for, a, for, for anything. But Nietzsche actually says at some point that uh, uh, the Ubermensch will not despise the slaves, because it's below the Ubermensch to despise the slaves. In fact, the Ubermensch will have uh, um, sympathy. What was, the, what was the phrase? Yeah, that... Um, the exceptional human being treats the mediocre more tenderly than himself. So some kind of uh, 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 tender, even maybe cordial feeling. So what, I, what I'm driving at, what I'm driving, and this is, this is basically what Sartre uh, uh, talked about at some point. He's like, is that, you know, this kind of project of self-creation is unavailable to most people, not because they're pigs, but because they live in a capitalist society. They do not, they do not have the, the structurally, there are structural reasons why they do not have the capacity to uh, realize themselves. And this is why I, I keep saying how in Nietzsche we seem to only see the individual project, but maybe if you fuse Nietzsche with Marx, there is a possibility of the collective project. Isn't that the whole point? Uh, something like that. Yeah, I, I'm tempted to say, you know, because I've been reading too much Sartre. So he has this wonderful phrase, uh, uh, so two anti-communist and ancien, right? Every anti-communist is a dog, and uh, I, I I kept thinking about this, and I think especially especially in terms of uh, um, um, Hobbes's distinction between inforo internal and inforo external, bracketing out the question of whether communism is attainable, so leaving that question to the, to one side. If you just look at the, at the at communism the way the way Marx presents it. You know, yes, you are a dog. I, I'm saying this on camera. If you, if you are an anti-communist, if you understand what you're talking about. And because of that, I think that Nietzsche would, would, would agree with the Marxist project, if he saw it. Problem is that he didn't, as far as I can tell. Okay, and on this um, possibly uh, uh, slightly too conflictual and counterproductive note, let me maybe finish this. I didn't say anything about the social justice, but do I even need to talk about that? I wonder. Probably not. Probably, probably, probably it's best at around time. Okay. Anyway, people, uh, uh, apologies for ranting a, a little bit too much. Um, I hope this was, uh, even though slightly haphazard, I, I hope this was at least to some extent useful. And I did manage to talk about a lot of Nietzsche, because uh, usually it's just a sidetrack of a sidetrack of a sidetrack. So if you have any questions, especially the bunch of quotes that some people will need to show me during the seminar, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Otherwise, again, thank you so much for bearing with this uh, uh, manic depressive uh, uh, display. And um, I'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.